Good morning. Um, so as you may have noticed, one of our panelists is joining us live via Skype. Um, James is in LA, so he'll be presenting through the magic of the internet. Um, so I'm Mark Herlansky. Um, I'm the project coordinator for digital engagement at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, DC. Um, I have no business being on this panel. Um, I say that because it's a panel about security, and I'm not a security expert. Um, web security is not a written part of my job description. I'm just the person who manages our websites and had to figure out what to do when ads for Viagra started popping up all over our blog, which is kind of an unfortunate turn of events for a publication dedicated to women artists. So most museums have a physical security staff, but there's not necessarily personnel dedicated to ensuring the digital security of the museum. At my museum, we have different people responsible for different things, security lives in different places, but we don't have one solid digital security policy. So I worked with our contract Drupal developer to sort out all of our issues, kind of lock down the security on all of our website properties, update our security mechanisms. I'm also addicted to the news. There's been a lot of high profile hacking incidents this year. Um, it really got me interested in exploring how and why security issues are on the rise and what museums should be doing to protect themselves. It seemed like kind of a growing critical issue, so I put the call out to the MCN community to gather together some experts to talk about it. So with that, I'd like to introduce my panelists and we'll go over the agenda. All right. Hello out there, good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Gegg and I'm the director of IT at the St. Louis Art Museum. I've been with the museum for almost five years now. I'm relatively new to the uh, cultural arts sector. I came out of the private sector in the newspaper business, believe it or not, originally. Oh, sorry. Is this thing working? Hello? OK. I'm uh, Adam Gegg, director of IT, St. Louis Art Museum. And I'm on this panel because I made the mistake of responding to an email about security. I don't consider myself an expert, but I do consider myself uh, an enthusiast of, uh, of, of uh, cybersecurity and information security. And we're going to tell a little, a little anecdote about ourselves. So uh, my anecdote just happened this morning. I got an email at 8.06 this morning that said, uh, Dear Agag23, that was my, my handle on this gaming website that I used to use years and years ago. Uh, this email was generated because a login attempt from a computer located at this IP address in Brazil. Uh, the login attempt included your correct account name and password. So uh, please confirm that that was really you. So this is a service that I hadn't used in years and years. Somebody found the account name, found the password somehow, and actually successfully logged into that account at 8 o'clock this morning from San Paulo, Brazil. So uh, that got my attention. I logged into the service. I had to remember what the password was. I couldn't even remember the damn thing. and. Um, quickly used a password generation utility to create a 35 character password and reset it to a, to a much stronger password that would be saved forever in my password safe. So uh, this stuff is real and it happens every day and if I had overlooked that email this morning, I'm not sure what would be going on. I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. My name is Angie Judge, I'm the CEO at Dexibit. Um, I uh, was once a, a systems analyst for a, a large consulting firm and we did a lot of work in the banking sector and at one of the big banks we worked for found a uh, incident where one of the mm -hmm. developers uh, or system admin had been uh, rounding up cents over the course of a few years made off with a few million dollars from one of the banks so that's my security horror story James, oh, James you want to introduce yourself Good afternoon. My name is James Vitale, coming to you remotely from Los Angeles. I am the Senior Solutions Architect at the LA County Museum of Art. I've been in this role now for about six years. And I was a victim of having a password stolen through an email cyber phishing scheme, as I'm sure many of us have experienced at one point or another. Very excited to be here with you all today and being part of this panel um, of great colleagues of mine and hope to share with you all some good information about securing your museums. Cool. Thanks. My name is Jeff Williams. I'm the Associate Director of Technology at the Hammer Museum. Um, about a year and a half ago, 
Um, I came into work one day and we had ransomware on the network and someone's, an ex a former employee's um, credentials had been compromised and they had spent, unfortunately, or fortunately only the last 30 minutes encrypting data, um, but we were, and we were able to recover everything, but it's still, it's, it's one of those things that affects everybody. And what day did that happen on? My 40th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> All right, so in this session, um, we're gonna start by covering some of the recent high-profile security breaches, just to give you kind of a lay of the land um, and what they can tell us about current risks and consequences potentially for museums. Um, we're gonna review a few of the most common tech trends that are impacting museums today and what their security implications are. And then we're gonna go into depth on a few specific issues uh, covering infrastructure, software, and system users. Um, after each of the three main sections, we'll have about five minutes for Q&A, so if you have kind of a pressing question related to that topic, um, we can take that too. Um, we also have a handout available um, at the table over there with some <laughs> of our top recommendations and tips for securing your institution just like, just to get started. So, if security attacks are on the rise, um, estimates are about 40% year over year. Um, more and more data is generated and stored in the cloud, and that brings with it the opportunity for identity theft, service disruptions, uh, <laughs> ransoms, and other kinds of malicious attacks. Um, this doesn't mean that everyone and every institution is in danger or potentially negligent. Um, you might know your own security vulnerabilities. You might have an institution or a boss or a board that doesn't necessarily see the value in investing in security precautions. Maybe they do, and that's awesome, and you're all set. Um, maybe there just isn't the funding for it without making hard decisions about reallocating your museum's budget. Um, for everyone, it kind of ends up being a balance. You attempt to manage what you can and take calculated risks based on the probability of some kind of attack happening. So we hope to make <coughs> the case for security investments in the field um, because museums really can't consider themselves immune and the consequences of some kind of incident are potentially huge. So Angie's going to take us through some of the horror stories just to freak you out a little and then we'll talk about what to do about them. I get the fun job today. <laughs> so reflecting on 2017, it really was a pretty disastrous year for cybersecurity. It is now the number one economic crime in the US and it's estimated that we lose about 6% of the economic value in our IP in this country every year um, to other nation states, so you can guess who those are. There are three ways that we usually find out about security vulnerabilities. Uh, one is when we do testing of our own, which I think everybody would agree most museums probably don't have enough resources to do as thoroughly as we would like. The second is when security researchers find them, which is a real double-edged sword because then we're racing the battle against the clock while the hackers are trying to exploit them and our vendors are trying to fix them. And then the third, which is when it is too late and we read about it in the news. And so there's a growing trend out there for cyber insurance, which is something that we recommend looking into, but today we're going to cover the IT response to security. So for a little inspiration while we get started, you may remember Equifax, this was the credit security breach, a big example of an institutional uh, lack of auditing. Um, this credit monitoring firm exposed personal data, extensive personal data for 143 million people, it considered the worst security breach to date. The hackers got through it, sadly, through a very known security uh, vulnerability that had a patch available. And it's not just famous for the breach, but also famous for the fact that the company may have known about it and then mismanaged their response to the catastrophe, um, including taking six weeks to disclose that they knew. So the lesson learned here is that it's easier to plan in advance and make things up as you go when the worst happens. No slide advancement. There we go. Um, everyone, I'm sure, will remember WannaCry, the ransomware uh, scandal from May uh, this year. This was a crypto worm. Um, it relied heavily on XP, which Microsoft stopped supporting in 2014, but many are still continuing to use it, including 
some really big institutions like the UK uh, Natu Nat National Healthcare Service. Uh, this thing swept the globe and infected 57,000 uh, systems in 150 countries in just 24 hours. So this was an unprecedented malware attack. Um, and it's a, a Trojan virus uh, called ransomware, which uh, takes your data hostage um, via encryption until a payment is made and things get uh, under more and more pressure as they go on. Um, and actually a 22-year-old security researcher uh, slowed the spread by accident by launching a site to track its progress. Um, but sadly, again, this was an, a vulnerability that was known about uh, uh, quite a long time ago by the NSA and Microsoft who had raised alerts about it eight months before it happened. And you may have seen this one in the news a couple of weeks ago. Um, a security researcher um, disclo disclosed a Wi-Fi in... Uh, uh, a Wi-Fi encryption protocol error. Um, most devices and routers rely on this method to encrypt your Wi-Fi traffic, so chances you uh, are affected by this thing called crack. Um, this is where the attacker can intercept some of the traffic between your device and your router, and if it's encrypted properly using HTTPS, then they can't look at the traffic and obtain your Wi-Fi password, but uh, they can look at your unencrypted traffic or even... Um, perform packet injection to do some pretty nasty stuff. So saving grace that the attacker needs to be in range of your Wi-Fi network. They can't attack you from miles and miles away. Sorry, the slides aren't just advancing. Cool. Um, but this one, they can be miles away. This is Blueborn, which has got a fair amount of uh, press. Um, with the rise of things like mobile and BYOD, which we'll talk about thing, uh, today, and uh, the Internet of Things, um, it brings about a whole new range of security issues, both uh, hardware and communication protocol vulnerabilities. So Blueborn um, makes use of Bluetooth, which has a lot of access to your device. So as a security hole, it really opens us up for a lot of damage and a lot of data loss. Um, and if you're a victim of Blueborn, you may not even know it. Um, and with meshing, the range on this thing could be huge, not just device by device. Uh, iOS 10 Plus is safe, but um, this mainly impacts uh, Android devices. And then uh, in June, 198 million US voters, possibly everyone who voted in the last decade, so most of the people in the room, I imagine, um, uh, were exposed by a conservative data root, uh, firm, Deep Root Analytics. They misconfigured an S3 server and allowed data to be publicly accessible on the internet. So although voter information is uh, somewhat publicly accessible, Deep Root specialised in compiling far more revealing data on voters. Um, they reckon it wasn't accessed by anybody aside from the security analysts that found it, but who knows. And security isn't just about hacks. T um, finally, as a last example, today um, we'll talk about how a lot of security risk revolves around our users. Um, Amazon found this out in their S3 outage earlier this year, um, uh, where sometimes the technical users, the ones we think we trust the most, uh, can be the most dangerous. Um, and this happened to a source code hub called uh, GitLab in the Netherlands. Um, they had a system admin who was a bit tired one night, pressed the delete key a few too many times and whoops, melted down um, and del uh, deleted a directory on the wrong server and wiped out 300 gig of live production data. Um, so what should have been a service interruption became a very de devastating data loss. And to make matters worse, their latest backup was six hours old. So any dev teams commits anywhere in the world uh, were then lost over that time. And the situation got worse when they discovered that all of their backups were ineffectual. Um, five out of five methods failed and they proceeded to announce their ever worsening failures in uh, tweets revealing the full extent of the issue. So with that inspiration underway, back to Mara. <laughs> Is everyone a little little anxious right now? Um, so yeah, there are consequences to all of these high-profile hacks. Um, loss of reputation, the actual cost of a ransom, um, loss of sensitive data, the loss of time, cost of necessary repairs that you would need to undertake. Um, I would also add that with incidents like Blueborn and Crack specifically, the idea of uncertainty comes with its own consequences, um, both psychological and the time that you spend trying to figure out what exactly 
you should be worried about. Um, I personally like refused to go on Wi-Fi for a week because I was just like, I don't, I don't know. I'm waiting for a security patch. I'm not sure what I should do. Um, so with all these incidents, there's definitely some key issues for museums to consider. Um, and we're, we're trying to pose the question, if, if resources are at <coughs> museums are notoriously tight and the likelihood of these crimes are on the rise, wouldn't it be better to prepare in advance? Um, so what can we take away from a lot of these incidents and what can we do to keep our museum safe? There's really no indication that museums should consider themselves exempt from this kind of crime. Um, just around a week ago, a week and a half ago, uh, a major American museum experienced a data breach of their institutional email, um, exposed a trove of sensitive information like credit card numbers, confidential <coughs> donor data, um, hackers, bots, Cyber criminals, they don't care who you are or what your institution is, they care about finding where they can exploit vulnerabilities. So we're gonna go into greater depth in the next section, but it's worth remembering some basic security measures we can all take away from hearing about some of these incidents. Remember to stay informed, listen to updates, stay patched, including for bring your own device users. That includes your work phone, your home phone, laptops. Um, know who your partners are and what they're doing to stay secure if you're using third-party applications. Um, routinely audit your configurations and make sure to stay on top of alerts. So these are five of the big trends we've identified as having the greatest impact on security right now that will kind of frame our upcoming discussion. Um, just as a show of hands, like raise your hand if your museum offers mobile tours or experiences for visitors. Um, does your museum have staff cell phones or other devices like iPads or laptops that leave the museum? Um, do you offer Wi-Fi in your building? Uh, do you ever telecommute, even if occasionally? Yeah. Um, do you use cloud-based apps and storage, like things as simple as Dropbox, Google Drive, uh, WordPress, uh, like open source technologies? Um, social engineering uh, refers to psychological manipulation of people into performing an act to release information, which is basically what Adam experienced this very morning. Um, common examples are like email phishing, computer hoaxes, um, even something just like following somebody physically into an access controlled area, you know, relying on common courtesy that nobody will say like, hey, what are you doing here? Um, Raise your hand if you've received any kind of suspicious email in the past year. Yeah. Um, so with that in mind, um, we're going to move into our in-depth coverage of three main areas of museum operations. Um, not everything will necessarily apply to your institution. Um, and most likely, your museum is already doing a lot of this stuff. But we want to give you a broad overview of potential vulnerabilities um, so that you can address what you should be thinking about in order to make actionable decisions to protect yourself. Um, so Jeff will cover infrastructure, so the basic physical and digital organizational structures and facilities in the museum. Adam's gonna cover software, programs, operating systems, and James, live from Los Angeles, will be covering uh, issues related to users, the people that run the museum and use the infrastructure and software. So now for Jeff. when I first started thinking about infrastructure required to lock it down, I was focused on hardware solutions like firewalls, VPN appliances, enterprise level wireless systems, and manageable network switches. But I quickly realized that's only half of it, the hardware. There are a lot of number of organization processes that help, from, help form the underlying foundation of the basic fr framework for network security. So the basic framework of network security needs to be protecting the institution's network, users' desktops, and the institutional data. The key word being protection, and by protection I'm specifically talking about making it so it can be not accessible by those who don't need access. In order to encrypt, modify, or delete the data, data say on a website on museum's intranet, access is required. And to protect these assets, a mix of processes and hardware are required. And it's important not only to have processes for prevention, but also <coughs> for what to do in the case of an incident. 
In the case of an emergency, processes and workflows allow staff to quickly execute a plan to help minimize the damage. So protecting the physical side is something that museums generally do pretty well. Um, I've learned a lot from working with my, um, just the general security team. Um, once again, the goal is here is to make sure that staff and guests aren't where they shouldn't be, in this case it's physically, and not only talking about limiting access to places like the data center or to a closet network, network switches, but also offices and public spaces that may have network outlets accessible. This will help control access to computers on networks and restricts access to networking equipment. Now, I know in general the museum sector isn't a big target for these types of physical on-site hacks, but sometimes people just get curious and want to look around, and sometimes people don't have malicious intent, but their computer could be unknowingly infected by malicious software just waiting to be connected to a network to infect the network. This is why it's important that all computers have malware and antivirus running on them. The next level of protection is protecting your wireless network, making sure your user using an enterprise level wireless system that can be configured so that guest Wi-Fi users cannot access the museum's private network. This can be done using access policies and VLANs. A VLAN is a virtual local area network and VLANs allow several networks to virtually work as one local area network. And there are many reasons why to set up VLANs, but in the context of this presentation, VLANs can be prov provide segmentation of a network and assist in issues like security, network management, and scalability. For internal Wi-Fi, MAC addresses, which are unique to each device, can be filtered as to, to only allow particular devices on the network. I also recommend setting up internal Wi-Fi to use domain authentication. That's a much better solution than having a shared wireless password. This allows real-time control of Wi-Fi access as the user will lose access to internal Wi-Fi immediately once their login has been disabled. And actually, this is one of the, when we got impacted by ransomware, this is basically what happened. A user had been let go, or actually, in this case, had um, been away from the institution for a couple of weeks. Their account wasn't disabled, and so this is why um, processes aren't so important, just to make sure that those credentials aren't still out there. Many of the same systems used to protect the wireless network can also be used to protect the museum's wired network. Port, port security can be used to limit access to wired network. Access policies and VLAN configuration can be used to ensure staff only have access to the specific data that they need access to. Um, network authentication and user management can also help to ensure that staff only have access to the specific data that they need access to. I mean, that's, that's a, it's a huge thing, is like making sure that people can't access or have basically the minimum um, access necessary. So protect processes to ensure that only active staff can have active accounts is just as important as these accounts can become network vulnerabilities. Um, and last but not least, firewalls and security appliances can help restrict network traffic internally and externally to prevent potentially malicious traffic from getting on the network. And pictured here is a Cisco ASA 5585X, which is what the hammer uses as our firewall. And it's a single device. It's a firewall, a VPN appliance, and an intrusion prevention center. And Cis Cisco equipment can be quite expensive and too costly for m many of the smaller museums, but they offer great discounts for nonprofits, organizations, and you can find up to 70% 70 70 off, off retail if you go with certified pre-owned <coughs> appliances with a lifetime warranty. And these allow you to scan all traffic coming in outside as well as between web servers and your production network. When it comes to protecting your data, the first place to start is with a well-developed and fully implemented backup policy. When building this backup policy, it's important to discuss within the institution what an acceptable amount of data loss would be, identifying which systems can't afford any data loss and which systems aren't as important. Ideally, you could take a backup of everything every second, but for most institutions, that's not physically possible. The backups are very important when it comes to network security as they allow your, your last line of defense of your and help the IT staff sleep at night knowing that if the network was compromised, then you'd be able to get everything back up and running. In the worst case scenario, with, with an acceptable amount of data loss. Similarly, it's important to have backups stored offsite, and there are many options for this, including AWS with this S3 and Glacier, Iron Mountain, 
And yes, some institutions still use backup t tapes. So this is really all about prevention when it comes to infrastructure. Um, the firewall these days often offer network intrusion prevention systems built into them, which is helpful um, to prevent against intrusion. And as we spoke in the previous slides, database backups and backups of all systems are the best protection from data encryption and ransomware. Um, and then endpoint protection like Sophos antivirus, um, and there are many of these which are available for free, um, running on all staff and personal computers. This can help protect against malware distributed via email, block malicious website, and quarantine infected files. Um, so that's a super high level um, discussion on that. Um, does anybody have any questions about any of the infrastructure side of things? I have a question that I have a question. Sure, yes. With regards to backup, it's really important not just that you have your backup, you have to test that your backup right. backup is working. If there are a lot of organizations who <coughs> count on it and they'll never use it, there's a problem. Right. The other issue with backups is when you buy backup software, and a lot of times the default is not to back up images because it saves too much data. Yeah. Yeah, I found that's one of the hardest things that I'm still struggling with at, at the Hammers. I think we have about 50 terabytes of images and how to back those up. Those don't need to be backed up every, every week because those you take a picture and they really never change. Um, but a lot of the backup software, we use Backup Exec, it just wants to kind of redo everything. Either you do an incremental, you know, but then, or a full backup and, you know, so uh, totally. And a lot of it is also the, the processes, right? Like you have to, have, you've got to audit your backups, you've got to test through them, you have to have procedures for that. Because in the case of an event in which you're trying to get things back up online, if you don't have to think, if you can just follow like the steps on a sheet of paper, it just helps with everybody when you get things back up quickly. So I agree with all of your points. Any other questions, comments? All right, thanks guys. Software. <laughs> I'll be talking about software for a couple of minutes here. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, let me see if this is going to advance. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Adam Gegg, St. Louis Art Museum. And um, for the past couple of years, uh, the team in St. Louis has really been focused on, on improving our, um, our information security posture, as they like to say, and reducing our attack surface, which is another little piece of jargon that you hear thrown around a lot. Uh, so I think we've come a long way. Um, I've got some opinions about what works and what doesn't. Um, I'll share those uh, with you, and, and, and I guess I'll start with a little bit of a sort of a philosophical framing of the way I think about security. And um, I didn't invent this, but there's a term called a security stack, like a layer cake of, uh, of tools that you use to uh, to work together to provide the best security that you can. So the idea there being you can think about traffic as it traverses your network. It comes from the outside to the edge at the firewall, gets through the firewall, gets into the network, and then eventually gets down to the, to the desktop or to the server. So you've got two or three or four different opportunities there to inspect that traffic, to apply some kind of logic and filtering to it. And so what I like about that model is you don't need a silver bullet. You don't need one thing that's going to do everything. You just need several things that might work together and, um, and a combination of all those things will provide you with, with uh, satisfactory security and, and it allows you to be a little bit more flexible in, in the way you're picking those, those, uh, those security ingredients so you don't always have to go best of breed all the way across as long as you have a, uh, have a, have a sort of a, a recipe or a combination that provides what you're looking for. So um, the three things that I'll talk about very briefly are protecting the network, sort of uh, mirroring what, uh, what we talked about with the, the hardware side, protecting the network, protecting the endpoints, and then um, look at a couple of different remote access solutions that, that, that we have uh, evaluated and that we're using internally. So looking at network protection, um, threat avoidance is, is really what, um, what I think is the most important part there. And, and uh, what we use is a service called um, um, OpenDNS, or Umbrella, from Cisco. And, and does anybody here not understand what the domain name system is or understand how it works and what role it plays? Um, most of us probably do. I've got uh, another little bit of a slide that kind of shows it in some more detail. 
essentially the, the, the domain name system works at the foundation of the internet. It's kind of like the white pages for the internet, if anybody here actually remembers what the white pages used to be. It's a, it's a table or it's a database that, that equates human readable addresses like www.slam.org to the actual IP address of the server that hosts that information. So you don't have to remember all those numbers, you just need to know what the web address is. So any traffic that happens on the internet involves a DNS lookup at some point or another. So um, at the bottom of this slide, it might be a little bit hard to see, but at the bottom is, is kind of representing your local network. And then as you move up to the second layer, that's where the DNS query happens, like where is google.com or where is mcn.edu and then uh, that DNS decision is made and you are given the, the actual IP information of the server hosting that content. So where, where Umbrella or OpenDNS fits in is uh, they are a hosted DNS platform. They've been around forever. I've been using them for a long time. Cisco bought them a couple of years ago because um, they like to do that. Uh, but but uh, basically, uh, all modern malware and viruses use DNS at some point in order to function. So typically what'll happen is a piece of malware will get onto a PC, it'll exploit some kind of vulnerability, and then at that point it'll phone home, it'll check in with a command and control server outside, either for more instructions or to start exfiltrating data. That phone home oper phoning home operation requires another <coughs> DNS lookup. So at that point, you've got an opportunity to stop that right in its tracks. Um, likewise, if you're browsing the web, you can mistype a URL, you can click on a on a malicious advertisement, you could click on a phishing link in an email. All of those operations are going to involve DNS in order to execute. So um, the way Umbrella works is you point your internal servers to use OpenDNS's public DNS servers. There's two of them out there, they're listed in the handout. Um, and that way any DNS request that happens on your network, whether it's your production network, your guest wireless, um, you can even uh, set it up on roaming laptops and handheld devices, iOS, Android, will be filtered through that DNS lookup at, uh, at Umbrella. So why it matters is uh, they're processing 100 billion requests a day globally. They've got 86 million active daily users of Umbrella and OpenDNS. So that's a lot of data that they're using to build these, uh, these models and, and make these decisions as to whether or not the request is legitimate or questionable. And they're, they're keeping track of um, known bad web URLs, known bad registrars, places where people are registering hundreds of, of domains a day, which is one of the things that the WannaCry did. It was, it was pointing back to all these brand new domain names that were registered in bulk moment by moment by moment. OpenDNS pays attention to those registrations and, and intentionally gray lists those sites. They say, these might be, these might be questionable, so that, that they may, they're gonna block your access to those. Um, other advantages of it, it's obviously, uh, in my opinion, very easy to configure and support, and um, you can use it on, on like your guest wireless. I use it at home, I use it on, I've been, I, I told my mom and my dad to use it, I recommend it to everybody. It's, it is, in my opinion, the single best thing you can do to secure your, your digital life, your network, your enterprise, uh, you name it. Um, this is really what I call threat avoidance rather than content filtering, because content filtering is kind of a slippery slope, right? A lot of our institutional missions really require that we don't filter any kind of content. Libraries are, are particularly um, sensitive to that. You can use this for content filtering, and a lot of educational institutions do, do use it for that. So you can filter on pornography, hate speech, gambling, I mean, alcohol, drugs, you name it. You can filter by content using this, uh, this platform, but you don't have to filter anything at all. You can simply use it to filter malware. We're paying about $18 per user per year, which I think is a, a, a slam dunk. I mean, it, it's the best money we're spending, but you can, you can do it for free. You don't have to pay them anything to take advantage of these services. You just won't get the reporting and the, uh, and the, uh, the administrative tools. So protect the network. Open DNS, that's the big one. Um, another, another method of protecting the network is network monitoring and alerting. So the idea there is you don't have the time or the expertise to comb through logs all day long. You've got more important things to do. So you want to set up network monitoring agents to alert you when things happen that require attention. And that could be performance related, letting you know when CPU or memory loads exceed a certain threshold. It could be 
letting you know when software patches aren't up to date, letting you know uh, when too many logins have happened in too short a time. It's basically automated monitoring of, of your network. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. There's some free stuff out there like Spiceworks that a lot of folks use and, ha and, and enjoy a lot. Um, we, uh, we use an enterprise solution from Microsoft called System Center Operations Manager and Configuration Manager, SCOM and SCCM. I love these acronyms. <laughs> uh, the nice thing about Operations Manager is it deploys an agent. It's got a little agent on all of our servers and then if any of these um, thresholds get tipped, if we go past 80% CPU, 80% RAM, or, or disk, disk I.O. slows down, it'll pop up an alert and open a ticket. And if that uh, condition clears, it'll c clear the alert, close the ticket for us automatically. So it doesn't require a whole lot of care and feeding administratively because if you're like me, you, you've got a small team, you don't have one person dedicated to this kind of work. It, it's, it, it really needs to just you know, yell when it's on fire and get out of the way when everything's okay. Um, it also monitors your virtual infrastructure, network, um, um, you name it. Um, uh, I guess that's it for that. Any questions on any of these? And if, if you do, let me know. If you've got other things that you want to share, I think that's the end of the collaboration is what we're here for. Um, moving down to the desktop level, on the desktop side, it's obviously antivirus, anti-malware. On the antivirus side, uh, th th there's really two flavors. There's the traditional antivirus and then the, what they're calling next generation or next gen antivirus. The, the traditional stuff is, is what you're used to. It's definition based. You have to download a definition periodically, hopefully daily or multiple times a day. And if, the, if, a, if a piece of malware is known and it exists in that definition file, your antivirus can act. But if the malware is not known or your definition file is not up to date, your antivirus, uh, your traditional antivirus is going to be ineffective. Uh, with next generation stuff, next gen is not typically definition based. A lot of them are, are, are really proud about not being definition based. They use things like um, machine learning and big data analysis and behavioral monitoring, uh, all these buzzwords. But basically they're, they're paying attention to how the machine is used and trending over time. And if they see activity or files being touched that are out of the ordinary, they'll respond uh, by blocking that access. As you would imagine, the uh, next-gen stuff is pretty expensive, and the traditional is a little bit more affordable. Uh, I, we did a lot of research on this a couple of years ago, and the big players in the next-gen space are companies like CrowdStrike, Silence, um, I forget, there's another one we looked at, but they were all right around $100 per PC per year, you know? So if you've got a lot of computers, that's a significant expense on an annual basis. And so what we ended up doing was just going with Microsoft's built-in antivirus software that's uh, built into our Windows subscription, which is another example of that kind of good enough. And then we laid up on top of that Cisco's advanced malware protection, which is another agent that just focuses on malware. So those two things together kind of stack up to provide what we consider to be satisfactory endpoint protection. Um, and that, that costs 25 bucks a year in, in our situation, which is just the Cisco license. Uh, so, so that was acceptable from a budget perspective. Uh, another thing that we do that I think is very effective is application whitelisting, which is just what it sounds like. You're, you've got a whitelist of approved applications, and if the application isn't on the list, it won't run. And that includes installers, EXEs, DLL files, um, web plugins. Um, it, it's a great tool. It's built into Windows 10 and Windows 7 Enterprise, so it's effectively free with your operating system if you're running Enterprise. You manage, it, you manage it using a, a group policy, so it's a, it's a regular GPO deploy, and you deploy it with Active Directory security groups, so you can have different configurations for IT versus marketing versus HR. Um, the one thing to watch for is to run it in audit mode for several weeks or months before you go live with it, because invariably there will be some program running on an engineering workstation or a security terminal that you don't know about, which will get broken when you turn this thing on and, and, and it could be disruptive uh, you know, to the operation of your facility. But it's another one of those, um, um, a little bit more at work on the, on the upfront side, but the benefit is, is great. This is always, this ne next to keeping things patched, application whitelisting is what everybody says to do. Like the folks at NIST and SANS, that's always number one or two on their list and it's built in. Um, moving on to remote access, there's several different remote access technologies out there. We are running, um, sort of a, a mix. The three that we've got experience with at the St. Louis Art Museum are remote desktop via the web, which is just like remote desktop on your network, but it's available on a public-facing web server. And you can't really see it here, but we, uh, 
we're running some programs that are uh, Windows only, like uh, TMS and our Razor's Edge and our, uh, our, our budgeting system is a Windows only application. But using a solution like this, Max can access it, you can access it from your iPad, you can access it from, from a non-Windows platform because it's really just a remote desktop session that's running on a server in my environment that we make sure is fully patched and protected and updated and all that. So um, it's, it's, like, it's like VDI uh, in a sense, but it's just running in a window. Um, that's, my, uh, that's what we're doing a little bit of. We're, we're, I'm kind of skunk, work, skunk worksing that one because uh, it does have some security considerations and senior management isn't, isn't fully on board, I guess, with some of the stuff that we're cooking up in the basement. Uh, Another solution for remote access is the traditional VPN client that I think everybody's familiar with. And then third, we've got uh, hosted solutions like Log Me In. And um, we're using a mix of those, of, of all three of those. And I just put together a little chart of what I consider strengths and weaknesses of, uh, of each of those approaches. Um, like I said, my, my personal favorite is the remote, remote desktop via a web server because, again, it's built into Windows. Um, it, it is a little bit more complicated to set up and you need to be very cognizant of your security because that is a publicly addressable website, right? So you need to make sure you've got your certificates and your SSL turned on, fully patched, enforcing complicated Active Directory passwords because folks are logging in with their AD credentials into this thing and it's public facing. So um, you need to be careful, but it's a very, it, it's a great tool. Uh, Log me in is another one that we use, believe it or not. And I thought that was kind of a joke when I started. I thought, who uses that, that stuff, you know? But uh, it really works well because you can enforce things like two-factor login. It, again, is a remote control technology, so you're not letting any traffic onto your network. You're not allowing anybody's machine to pull data in or out of your secured enterprise network. Um, it does require a dedicated PC on the other side because it is really a remote control. So you're tying up a terminal on the inside of the network, but we're doing things with like um, setting up a, a, a virtual machine as a target, you know, for log me in. So you're not tying up actual hardware, at least. Uh, I like that, it works pretty well. We're paying like nine bucks per PC per year, and that's licensed by the computer, not the user. So you can have as many users as you want, but you're only paying for the PCs, which is kind of nice. And uh, my last choice is VPN, and I'll probably get some pushback on that. I don't like VPN, um, at least in our environment. Uh, I don't like computers connecting directly to our network from the outside, because we can't guarantee that those computers are fully patched, that they are clean and free of any viruses or vulnerabilities. It opens the door to data infill and exfiltration because you're creating a real network connection. And also, uh, if you have enterprise applications that need to run on those remote machines, you need to install them, update them, and manage them. Um, and if you own those machines, you're probably able to do it. But if you're dealing with contractors or third parties or home users using their own personal PC, um, uh, I. Uh, I personally don't, don't prefer VPN. I do prefer one of the other two technologies, but uh, that's just what we're doing and, and what our experience has been. I think that's all I had. So if anybody has any questions, pushback, suggestions. Because you've got to run it on that remote terminal. <laughs> yeah, that's another problem with VPN because everybody at home has got a 192.168 local network, and if you have one at, on the other side, which we do, I'm embarrassed to say, our, 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 our production network is a 192.168, I'll admit it. <laughs> it won't be like that forever, but it is right now, and that causes problems, right? Uh, others? Kevin, if you were recommending that pretty much everybody should be open DNS using their own router? Absolutely. Is that, is that true for commercialized versus the rise of big IT? You can use it, you set it up on your router, on your, on your home router, and then any, anything that is on your network is gonna pull that DNS. And uh, we've gone so far uh, at, at the St. Louis Art Museum, I'm a, I'm a bit of a firewall, um, uh, uh, what's the term for it? I'm a little over enthusiastic about restricting access through the network, Wendy back there can agree. Um, so I'm blocking all DNS requests to anything but open DNS as servers. So if you come onto my guest wireless and you're trying to use a different DNS server, it's not going to work because another another new hack that people are doing is sending out doing that data exfiltration over port 53 which is dns over udp port 53 because typically that's allowed right that's dns that's okay or or uh but it's not because what they're doing is, is they're packaging your your private sensitive data and sending it out over an approved port right 
So we, we block all, all 53 traffic unless it's only going to one of those two IP addresses. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to leave him enough time. Yes. So James is going to come up, and I'm going to move him over here and turn him up. Can you hear us, James? Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. All right. I'm going to click. Am I coming in clear there? Yeah, you sound great. Okay. And away we go. So I hope you all have been enjoying the presentation so far, and I'll be taking us on to the third and final part of our presentation, which is responding to museum security from the perspective of our users. We go on to our next slide. So when we talk about users in the museum, there are a few different perspectives that we want to consider. So let me just back up for a moment. So far, we've talked about infrastructure and software, which are both key components of locking down security at each of our institutions. At the end of the day, even with the best choices in both of these areas, without building a community of knowledgeable and aware users, we remain at significant risk for security experiencing a variety of breaches. During this part of our presentation, we will focus on several topics that are essential for each institution to address in order to empower its users to become partners in locking down security. So with that in mind, we'll be looking at mobile security, endpoint security, our users' online and offline behaviors, and building a stronger partnership between IT and HR. Keeping our users secure begins with their mobile devices. And the, with the ever-increasing use of handheld cell phones, tablets, etc., cetera, it's, it's, it's essential that we acknowledge the importance of locking these devices down and taking precautionary steps to keep our users informed of what's necessary to be safe when they're using them. There are several ways that we can enable extra layers of security on our users' mobile devices. Uh, the first and perhaps most important is installing location-finding software on your device. So for those of you with iPhones in the audience or iPads, you're probably already familiar with software such as Find My iPhone. And there's similar software available for Android devices as well. What's important about this software is not only does it make it possible for you to retrieve your phone in the event that it's been lost or stolen, but perhaps even more important is the ability for you to lock the device and if necessary, wipe any sensitive information that you may have on that device, which you don't want to fall into the wrong hands should it no longer be in your possession. Going down the same path of securing these devices, in today's world, it is necessary to have antivirus software even on your mobile devices, as well as good malware software. So we're talking about antivirus software. There's a number of reputable organizations out there, such as Symantec, ESET, and others. And you can go on and read the online reviews to pick a package of your choice. But again, the basic premise is to don't leave yourself unprotected and uh, better to be safe than sorry. Lastly, we want to encourage staff in our institutions, both on their business devices as well as their personal devices, to regularly check for firmware and security updates. This is one of the best protections you can give yourself against the possibility of zero day attacks. So if you don't have the latest firmware or security updates on your phone and an exploit goes out into the field that's trying to take advantage of a vulnerability in your device's firmware or software in the operating system and you haven't been keeping it up to date, you're that much more likely to be susceptible to those kinds of attacks. So it's so just a few of the pointers that we can offer to secure this particular endpoint. Moving on. We also have to acknowledge that our users at our institutions aren't on their mobile devices all the time. They're often connected to our networks using a desktop or a laptop. And, and at times these may not even be company issued devices, further increasing the concerns that we must have around endpoint security. In either case, it's essential that all of these devices at minimum have good antivirus and anti-malware software installed. For those persons running the Windows 10 operating system, 
Its built-in security is an excellent solution and well-maintained by Microsoft directly. In other cases, we may find at our institutions that an enterprise solution provided by companies such as Symantec or ESET is also necessary so that there can be central management of the virus solution and making sure that updates are pushed out in a timely fashion. In either case, once again, it's essential that there be both antivirus and anti-malware solutions present on all of these endpoints. And in many of our institutions, we're working in hybrid environments where we have both PC and Mac desktops and laptops spread throughout the campus. And we need to be sure we're taking all of those factors into consideration in order to have a effective security presence on those endpoints. Similarly, we also wanna be sure that we're scheduling as part of the IT policy, regular firmware updates, regular operating system security updates, and we're keeping those in place as rapidly as possible. And if we fall behind on those, we put ourselves at risk. And that's something that is a partnership, again, between IT and our end users, making sure that we're taking care of that on a regular basis. Lastly, as mentioned during Adam's presentation, it's very likely that many of our institutions have telecommuting users, people who are coming in remotely. And in some organizations, there are going to be VPN systems set up. So it's important that we work with the IT administrators to ensure that there's some degree of policy enforcement going on so that if users are coming in to our networks on their personal devices, whether it be a PC or a laptop, that those VPN portals are enforcing the minimum security requirements of the corporate networks and ensuring that there's appropriate virus software, malware software, et cetera, on those user devices before allowing them to connect via VPN. Again, our goal here is to minimize the security risks, knowing that we won't be able to eliminate all of them, but at least control the ones that we are aware of. Having talked about software and how we can use that to help secure our endpoints, the next best security practice that we can have is and well-informed users and making sure that our users are educated about what to be aware of when they're online. No amount of software can help prevent us from users who just didn't know any better. And it's most important if we wanna keep our users secure to keep them informed. So we're first going to talk about online behaviors and some of the more common ones that often create security risks in our organizations. We truly wanna encourage mindfulness around unfamiliar links. As we say here on our slide, if you see something, say something. It's so important to dispel any notion of uh, feeling bad or ashamed that you didn't that you didn't know what was going on with a particular link or, or you thought something looked familiar in an email. We want to encourage a, a collaborative community where people feel okay to ask their questions and say, you know, I'm not really sure. If you're not sure, forward the email, ask an IT partner, and ask. Uh, we'd rather that happen than go to a website that's unfamiliar. Nine times out of 10, malware is involuntarily downloaded by a user because they clicked on a link in an email or off of a website they were unfamiliar with. That takes us to our second point, which is to be a conscientious web browser. Most of the websites that are distributing malware or other forms of infected content are those that are not mainstream websites. So again, as much as we want to encourage users to seek out information and knowledge from a variety of sources, it's also important to be mindful about what websites you're going to. And again, if you're not certain that a website is safe, ask and do some searches about the integrity of that website. There are um, a number of sites out there that will help you determine if a website's reputable or not, and whether or not the, uh, the content there is okay to go out to. There are also tools such as Norton Safe Search, which installs a toolbar in your web browser to help pre-check a website to ensure that it is safe for you to browse out to. It provides you with another layer of uh, what we call threat avoidance. Again, the, the goal here is not censorship, it's threat avoidance and helping to keep you safe online. Equally important is um, trying to be aware of whether or not you're posting security sensitive data on social media. Uh, oftentimes we can put information out there without even realizing it that could be compromising to our organization. So if you're not sure if you should be posting something, ask. Along these same lines is the topic of authentication. We all have to juggle around multiple passwords these days and there is this inclination to want to be able to use our social media account, whether it's Facebook, 
uh, Google, et cetera, as a single point of authentication. Our advisement is uh, rather than going with a social media based form of authentication to consider a password vault and using that password vault to manage a variety of complex individual passwords to your different sites. It's generally a more secure approach and it's less dependent upon a, a single um, vendor for your authentication purposes and, and leaves you less exposed to being compromised. As I've been emphasizing throughout these points, again, if you see something, say something, uh, encouraging users to talk about their questions with each other and helping to avoid common mistakes uh, as a result. Most importantly, really we want to foster executive buy-in on user training. Uh, no amount of cyber insurance can replace the benefits of a well-informed user audience at your institutions. And if the executives buy in on this and invest in it, we really truly believe the rewards will speak for themselves. Next comes the offline behaviors, and we'll go through this list fairly quickly, but these are some basic things that we encourage you all to take home and share with your organizations. When you walk away from your desktop, lock your PC. Um, it'd be surprised how in just a matter of minutes somebody can go by and unlock PC and introduce a virus into your network. Similarly, physically lock down your laptops. Use cable locks, keep them out of sight if you're in a hotel room or in your car. Just don't encourage that piece of property to be stolen or hacked into. We need to eliminate writing down passwords. As tempting as it is, it's much better to use a password vault product rather than writing these down on a piece of paper. It puts ourselves and our organizations at risk. If you need to print secure documents, be sure they're kept in a secure location and avoid removing them from the workplace. Similar to locking your PC is maintaining a clear desk policy. If you have sensitive documents or other kinds of information that shouldn't be seen by prying eyes, best to keep that information uh, off your desk and locked away so that others can't get into it and use it for uh, incorrect purposes. And lastly, external, external storage devices, again, um, keep these in secure locations and be mindful of the information you're storing on them. And if the devices are stolen, report those theft, the theft of these devices immediately. Our very last slide here is, uh, again, the partnership between IT and HR. Uh, we want to encourage um, a variety of strategies here between these departments. These are a few of the topics that we have in mind, which is off-board and onboarding policies, changes in roles and responsibilities, monitoring fraud within your organization, and forming a game plan around security trainings and threat communications. And with that, we will go on to Q&A. Thank you. Anybody have any questions, anything to add? on servers and mailboxes, desktop machines, and they search every uh, thing they can looking for signatures of credit cards, social security numbers, and uh, we've been, again, surprised by the number of things that people have ferreted away mm -hmm. uh, that are spreadsheets of social security numbers and things like that, uh, that had somebody been able to break through, there was plenty of diamonds for them to find around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Data at rest. Anyone else? Thank you. Yeah, I know we're just about out of time. So if you have any extra questions, um, I think you guys be available for a couple yep. minutes. Yep. Um, and we have our security handouts up here. We're just gonna leave, oops, can you advance the slide? We're just gonna leave our main takeaways. All right, and uh, thank you everybody for coming.